So this morning I want to start, um, and if you've got your Bibles with you, I'm going to start straight in Luke 18, verse 1 to 8. <clears throat> and it's the story, or the parable of the persistent widow. Jesus told them a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. He said there was once a judge in some city who never gave God a thought and cared nothing for people. A widow in that city kept after him. My rights are being violated. Protect me. He never gave her the time of day, but after this went on and on, and he said to himself, I care nothing what God thinks, and even less what people think. But because this widow won't quit badgering me, I'd better do something and see what she gets, that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her pounding and nagging. You can obviously guess this is the message, <laughs> and not NIV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys must read the Bible more. Then the master said, do you hear what that judge, corrupt as he is, is saying? So what makes you think God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people, who continue to cry out for help? Won't he stick up for them? I assure you he will. He will not drag his feet. But how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on earth when he returns? That's the words of Jesus. I want to read that last line again. He said, but how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on the earth when he returns? My sermon title today is Do Not Throw Away Your Confidence. Do not lose hope. Do not discard your faith. There are many people today who are living with a sense of hopelessness. Maybe you've come across them. Maybe you feel like that this morning. Um, a sense that it's just not working. It's not worth it. It's not fair. I quit. I give in. I throw in the towel. And this sense of profound despair was also true of the people in the book of Hebrews who were under severe per persecution. Their lands were being taken away. They were being tortured. It was, it was a terrible time for the nation. Um, and they were on the verge of quitting the faith and going back to the world. They'd had enough. They didn't think that this Christian thing was worth it, and it just wasn't working out for them. There may be people who are seated here today who may look the part. But if truth be told, it's not working. Perhaps you're saying, I've got unanswered prayers. I've got unfulfilled dreams. Things in my life that I thought by now God was going to take care of. And nothing's happened yet. So I'm ready to throw in the towel. This morning we're going to be spending time in the book of Hebrews. And this book, especially chapter 11. If you've read the Bible a few times, you'll know. It's the hall of faith. It talks about all the heroes that have lived before us. Um, and the way that their faith brought them into a place where they pleased God. Um, and you discovered what God can do when God's people learn to live and walk and act by faith. The beautiful thing about this is it's not just about them. It's about us too. The author of the Hebrews writes to the New Testament believers, and that's precisely who we are, New Testament believers. Um, and saints who learn to live, uh, he, wants us to, he wants to remind us about how the, the lives of the Old Testament saints who learn, learn to live by faith should challenge and affect our lives as we live by faith. But more importantly this morning, we're going to be transformed by the truth of the Word of God, of what it means to be a kingdom believer who lives by faith. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews 10, 35 to 38. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 to 38, and this time I'll read from the NIV. Well, I mean, you guys looked really confused earlier. 10, 10 verses 35 to 38. I can't hear a rustling of pages there, Brad. Uh, it's rustling. Okay. <laughs> it says, So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Now, I hope that that phrase echoes in your spirit and in your mind for years to come. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, 
you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. My righteous one will live by faith. And I take, listen to this, I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Can you say amen this morning? Right. These people had, had been professing, declaring, and laying claim to the promises of God and the word that they had for their personal lives. They had done it boldly. They had done it audibly. They had done it publicly. Um, they have said what they believed. They have declared it loudly. However, now that the results weren't forthcoming and they were growing tired, they were feeling tempted to toss it away, throw it away, count it as nonsense. But this verge urged them to hold tight and to keep believing. And now, you and I must hang on to the, God's promises just as these Hebrew Christians hang on to the promises of God in, in their times of persecution. Hebrews says, I'm writing to you so that you don't throw in the towel. I'm writing to you to remind you and to encourage you to endure, to be steadfast. He says, the righteous shall live by Faith. Amen. The righteous shall live by faith. So whatever faith is, and whatever it's supposed to be, it's a way of living. The righteous live that way. It's a way of living. A lifestyle and not an event. The righteous shall live by faith. In other words, whatever faith is, is how we should be operating. That's our default modus operandi. It should be your lifestyle. It should be your normal way of operating. Faith is not a concept that we visit it's a lifestyle that we actively live because the righteous shall live by faith. So if you're born again and you've been made righteous, but you're not living by faith, you're in hiding to nothing. You're in trouble because the righteous who learn to live by faith get to experience God in action. That's what the word says. You get to experience God fulfilling his word. So you've got to ask the question, Am I living by faith? Because if faith is not my lifestyle and my language, then I'm not experiencing God in my circumstances. That's how the righteous roll. They live by faith. That raises a question this morning. What is faith? What is faith? How does it work? And that leads us neatly back to Hebrews, where we read about the heroes of the faith. In chapter 11, Verse 1. You can turn there with me if you want to. We're going to be looking at the first three or four verses. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith deals with the things that are real, but they have not yet penetrated our five senses because you haven't seen it yet. Hope is the expectation about the future of which you're convinced and convicted about right now. In other words, you're confident of this thing, even though this thing hasn't occurred yet. We've got to remind ourselves of the basics here. That's what faith is. Faith then, having said all that, must have a substance. Faith must have substance. It must have something that you can rely on. The King James says, now just know if I say King James, this is like serious stuff. Eh? I can feel tongues coming on. <laughs> Now, faith is the substance. Yeah. That's what the King James says. What this means is faith is only as meaningful as the substance to which it is attached. If you've got faith in a bad substance, then your faith will be insufficient. No matter how much of it you possess, because the substance you're placing it in isn't much. Or maybe it's not real at all. We read about people who worship wooden carvings and strange things. I mean, honestly, what kind of substance have you got to a faith that comes from a block of dead tree, you know? Um, faith has to do with an expectation. Have you got an expectation in your heart for something this morning? It's to do with a hope, and it must involve the substance. So your faith is not only tied to how much faith you have, it's tied to how much substance you possess. A little faith in significant substance produces great results. A lot of faith in insufficient substance will produce no results. Because what makes faith faith? 
is the substance to which is it, it's attached to. What is your faith attached to this morning? Is it your job? I've been there. That didn't work well. What is your faith attached to? Your husband, your wife? Well, it's a good time this morning to say, what is the substance of my faith? If you want to grow your faith, don't go hunting for more faith. First, make sure that you have the right substance. The surer the substance, the more solid the faith. This morning, it's not saying more of the same thing, coming to agreement more with, it's to say, who have I placed my faith in? So and to understand faith, you have to look at the substance of your faith. Let me clarify something about what faith is not this morning. Faith is not necessarily how you feel. You can feel faithless, but be full of faith. You can feel full of faith and have no faith. Um, and as much as it's beautiful to feel the presence of God in worship, or to hear beautiful music that makes you emotional, that's not faith, guys. That's feelings, that's tingles, that's wonderful. The presence of God's lovely. But faith is what you do when you're in the bottom of the lowest valley, but you know the integrity of the substance that you believed in. That's what faith is. Faith is not first and foremost an emotion. Emotions do not have intellect. Emotions don't think. It's simply how you feel. And gosh, do we know that feelings shift based on your circumstances. I mean, you can wake up feeling supernatural. There's 100,000 in your bank. You don't know who gave it to you, but you love them. Other days you can wake up thinking, oh, I'm tired of that mince in the freezer now. It better be finishing soon. <laughs> faith is tied to substance that is not yet seen or experienced with the five senses, but that you're convinced is real based on the integrity of who is calling for the faith. So who's calling for the faith when we read that scripture? It's God. He says, after you've done the will of God, after you've done the will of God. Now let me tell you why this sermon for many may be the most important one you've ever heard. Because Hebrews 11 says, without faith, it's impossible. Not maybe, it's impossible to please God. If you haven't bedded this down into the bedrock of your Christian walk, it's really difficult to have a relationship with God. A relationship that produces fruit in your life. A relationship where you can see what's written on the pages of the Word of God come to life in your life. It takes faith. It takes walking on the water. It takes getting out of the boat when you're scared. And doing it because you know the integrity of the one in whom you've trusted. Faith is not one of the things you need. It's the key thing you need. If you want to experience God, you have to have it. Because without it, it says you are displeasing to God. You're displeasing to Him. Many of us here today don't live by faith. Instead, we actually visit faith on occasions from time to time. You know, yes, I agree with you, I'll pray with you, I'll come into agreement, yes, yes, I can do that. We, and on the mountain, we are phenomenal with this faith. You can hear us for miles around. It's the valley that kills us. It's those little speed bumps that we don't expect, that we, we, we kind of forget about our faith, you know. You may be wondering, why is God getting all upset about whether I have faith or not? Well, when you don't exercise your faith, you're challenging God. You're saying, I'm talking to you, but I'm not really sure if you can do this. I'm not really sure that I can trust you. So let me give you a simple and yet profound definition of faith. And I found this incredibly helpful. Faith is simply acting like God is telling the truth. Isn't that beautiful? Faith is simply acting like God is telling the truth. But it's acting like, not feeling like God is telling the truth. It's not saying that God is telling the truth. It's not uh, saying that God is telling the truth. In fact, it's acting like God is, it's acting like God is telling the truth. What does that involve? It's why the Bible calls it walking by faith and not talking by faith. Or feeling by faith or even thinking by faith. You know, none of those are bad, but none of those will give you the results that walking by faith. Will give you. Unless it's hit your feet, it's not faith. And when I say your feet, it says walking by faith, and it's your actions because you said you believe him. Your resulting actions have to line up with what he said. Even though you can't see it, you can't feel it. It's raining, it's hailing, it's snowing. But he said what he said in the light, 
you need to remember in the dark. Yeah, Unless it's hit your feet, it's not faith. It's only intellectual agreement to a concept that hasn't been mixed with action. Therefore, nothing concrete shown up. You've been praying about something. You've been declaring something. It's not showing up in your life. Well, you've got to carry on. You've got to carry on in the light what you heard in the, in the dark, what you heard in the light. Because God is faithful to his word. He said it will never return void. So this morning I can tell you that the integrity of God is there. Let's mix it with our faith and action and see the results in our life. If you want a concrete manifestation of God, then what you believe about God must be married to what you do because of that belief. Exercising faith means that God can now become concrete in your life and not just a theory in your head or something that you've heard preached about. So I'd like to look at verse 2 there. It says, For by faith the men of old gained approval. He says, I'm going to take you on a tour of the men and women of the Old Testament in Hebrews chapter 11. He makes a statement in verse 1 about what faith is, and then he reaches back into the Old Testament and brings us a few witnesses. Um, for, for the New Testament Christians that never got to experience that, he tells us about them. He builds our faith. He wants us to know what worked for them is exactly what we need to work for us. When we go through the Hall of Faith, we're going to meet some witnesses, some witnesses that you've heard about. Abel's going to come forth, and he's going to be the first witness. Enoch is going to come forth, and he's going to testify about how he walked with God and wasn't anymore. God took him. Noah's going to come forth, and he's going to tell you a thing or two about rain. Abraham's going to come forth, and he's going to remind you of who God is. Sarah is going to come forth, and she's got some baby-making tips for you ladies. Rahab's going to testify as well, and David's going to give a testimony. Joseph's going to give a testimony. This great cloud of witnesses are coming forward today to testify to the fact that verse 1 is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. He said, by faith, the saints of old were approved. They were validated by God and vindicated by Him. There's nothing in your life like when God vindicates you or when God validates you. I love that whole picture of Jesus coming out from being water baptized and God saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Can there be anything more beautiful to say or have said about you than you and your father says that? In the end of chapter 10, it says that, and when he comes, and he will come, He's coming with his reward in his wings. He's coming to validate you. You don't get your graduation certificate when you enroll in college. You get it upon fulfilling the requirements when you've done the will of God. And that's why the end of chapter 10 says, and when you've completed the will of God. Some of us have been in college for 20 years. Plus. Because, but because we're not focused on completing the course, the will of God in our lives, here we are in our graduation gowns wondering why we haven't received the approval of certification and of graduation. Well, the validation and the vindication of a life of faith, to receive that you need to stay the course. You need to have persistent faith. Is your faith strong enough to hang in there this morning till the end, till you see results? We pick and choose what we want to believe. We believe God on the things we like. We disregard Him on the things that maybe we're not so keen on, you know? Uh, we're not living by faith. We're cherry-picking by faith. And this morning, we're going to take a hold of our thoughts and our conversation and our actions. We're going to say our lives are meant to be lived by faith because that's what pleases the King of Kings. He says, for the righteous, non-faith is the exception. Faith is the rule in spite of how they feel. It's, it caught your mind back. It's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who said, we believe God can deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down because we trust God. Even if he doesn't. He is not on probation. His character, his word, and his ways have convinced Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that they can fully, fully trust him. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be in a place of that where you're totally convinced there's not an ounce of doubt in your mind that you're prepared to go into a furnace that's heated to the max plus because you know the integrity. You know that you know that you know that God will never let you down. It's, it's incredible. He's the substance of their faith. 
It's like Rebecca says in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Though there's no fig on the tree, though there's no cattle in the stall, though I cannot see anything that God is doing, I'm still going to rejoice because I know who God is. You know, sometimes you've got to rejoice through the pain, through the tears, through the lack. All of it. Sometimes you've got to rejoice because in that rejoicing, what are you saying? God, my flesh is dying. My flesh is not well, but I know that you're integrous. I know that your word can be trusted. I know that you're the substance to which I can anchor my life. There's some strange people on this list in Hebrews 11. People who would never have made the list if we were making it, surely. You've got a prostitute. You've got a liar. You've got a murderer. Um, you've got a passive man. You've got a lady who laughed in the face of God on this list. You've got some messed up people here who made the list. But... That ought to be good news to somebody here this morning. Because even though you may, may feel like a spiritual failure, right now, if you will begin to live by faith as a lifestyle, God will let you make a list some people think you shouldn't be on. Um, that means there's hope if you now begin to live by faith and stop faking it till we make it. Yeah. We don't need to have our masks on you. We, need, we don't need to be perfect because we're not. He is perfect. When, God calls in uh, when God's integrity is challenged, challenged by our non-belief in Him, His promises lie dormant in our lives. They're there. They're full of power, but they're dormant because they need to be mixed with faithful action. Faithful action. Brings me to the final point in verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the Word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. You think it's hard for you to believe this? Well, God created a whole galaxy, a whole universe, just by His Word. That's who you've anchored your faith to this morning. To make my point about faith, let me take you all the way back to the beginning. He says, we understand that the world that we do not see was created by someone using something we don't see. It's quite mind-boggling, actually. Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It says the worlds, and notice the word worlds in verse 3 is plural. That means the whole universe, not just the earth. The whole universe, all the galaxy, galaxies that exist, were created by someone that you can't see. Using stuff you can't see to create a universe that you can see. A universe that we're still trying to look up through telescopes and Lord knows what, Hubble, something, something, something. We're trying to find galaxies that even our strongest telescopes cannot find. God used this strategy to create the universe. Verse 3 says, He created them by a rhema word spoken. A word, rhema word means a divine utterance spoken by God. Genesis 1, in the beginning God said, Let there be light, and there was light. He said, let there be water, and let the water be separated from the land, and it was. So God uttered a word, and something came from nothing because of what he uttered. That is your God. That's my God this morning. Do you need something to come from nothing in your life this morning? Because I know a man who utters a word and changes it, makes galaxies. Our three-year-old grandson, Matteo, was learning to swim. And he loves the water, but he really, wasn't very confident. Um, so I would be in the pool, and I would encourage him to jump from the side of the pool, and just jump, Matty, jump, jump to me. And I would make sure that when I caught him, I didn't lift him up and out of the water. I kind of kept him there. I wanted him to experience the water. Um, he didn't love this experience, as his expectation was that I would stop the water from going in his eyes and mouth by lifting up above the water. And my expectation was that he would feel the security of my presence. The sturdy touch of my hands and grow in confidence to eventually doggy pedal towards me. That was the goal. It took some time to get Matteo to act on my instruction to jump. You've met Matteo. He's a little busy body this big. You see, it wasn't always like that. Let me take you back a little bit. Let me rewind. Initially, I picked him up and put him in on the side of the pool and I said, jump. He said, no, I'm not. I'm scared. I said, I've got you, man. Relax. Jump. He said, no, 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 I'm not. I said, Matty, but I'm right here. I'm right here. I've got you. He said, no, no. 
But I kept uttering the word, jump, uttering the word, uttering the word, jump, Matty, jump. The problem is that he wasn't believing the word. <laughs> Matty wasn't convinced that I either had the will or the ability to catch him and that I would let him fall. That was his big concern. After pounding him with the word over and over, jump, Matty, jump, he came over to the edge and he said, Papa, that's what he calls me, Papa, can you come closer? You're too far. When he asked me to draw in here, I came a little bit closer. And I, and I got a little bit more you know, closer and nearer to him because I knew that the closer I got, the more confidence he would have. The closer he, I got, the more confidence Matt he had. So I said, jump. And he lifted up one leg but kept the other leg down. And he just <laughs> fell on me. Like this. I thought that was a jump. I said, no, no, no. I put him back on the pool. And this time... He knelt down and said, Papa, do you think he promised that you'll catch me? <laughs> I said, I do. And then we did. And the next time we counted to three, Matty jumped ha, and landed in the middle of the pool. And we've never looked back. The man swims yeah. like a fish. But that story ties in so beautifully with the way God treats yeah. us as, as children of God. And the rest is history. Now, him and I can be walking, holding hands, because there's traffic or cars or whatever, and suddenly he will count one, two, three on his own and start swinging himself off my unsuspecting arm. <laughs> Just, you know, this is a man that couldn't trust me a few weeks ago, yeah. who's now taken that faith and turned into action. Let's just swing off my arm because he knows that he can trust me. Um, once Matty became convinced that he could trust me in the pool, it gave him future faith to dangle his weight off my arm without thinking twice. And that's what happens when you live by faith. The first couple of times are hard, but after a while, it's a well-worn path. For you to trust your dad's nothing, because you've seen him in action. Faith is simply acting like God is telling the truth. It's acting like it's so, even when it's not in order, that it must be so, simply because God said so. When we learn to walk with our feet and behave in faith, based on what God has revealed, we can see His power change our circumstances. So I want to challenge you to become a kingdom hero. And I know times have been tough. I know there's been family drama, financial instability, the fear of what the future holds. It's all there. Will you ever find a husband? Will you ever find a wife? Will you ever get another job? The anxiety and the list goes on. The author of Hebrews says, you don't give up. Don't throw away your confidence. The way you keep moving is by faith. You dig your heels in. By faith, Abel. By faith, Noah. By faith, Moses. By faith, Rahab. By faith, they passed to the Dead Sea. The walls of Jericho fell down because of faith. Do you need some walls to fall down? Do you need some walls to fall down this morning? Let's join our faith, man. We are to be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Noah had to make a decision like you and I. Are we going to believe enough to obey God's word? Or are we going to settle and agree to the culture that has rejected it? That's the battle of our time. Is we fighting a culture who doesn't want to know the king of kings. You've got to make a choice today. Do you settle into that lukewarmness? Do you, settle, do you come to church not really trusting the God you believe in? Is that the, the life that we want to live? No. God says He's called us to an abundant life. He's made provision for us in every single area to live in abundance. I want you this morning to dig into your faith. To hold on to it. You know, the Bible says in the last times, people will, will grow weak. They'll grow tired. They will fall away from the faith. If you feel this morning that that's something that's even crossing your mind, I want you to know that's a strategy from the pit of hell. The devil does not want you to go to heaven. He does not want you to be with God. And he will do everything in his power to stop you. If you're feeling some resistance, welcome to the club. What have you got to do? You've got to have persistent faith this morning. You've got to dig your heels and say, I don't care what I hear, I don't care what I see, I don't care what I feel. All I know is the one in whom I believed has integrity. Won't you stand with me this morning? (coughs) 
Father, we, we come to you this morning. We don't have the ability to change lives. We're just men. Father, your word comes from your mouth. It comes from your heart. It's backed by your power. It's backed by your integrity. So, Father, this morning your word says that you're not a man that you should lie. We don't, we don't even look for any opportunity where we put you on trial to explain yourself. Because we, we're just men. You created this earth. Father, we ask this morning that every person that stands here has a revelation by your spirit of how important it is for us to hang on to our belief of you, our hope of you. We ask for courage this morning, Lord. We ask for your spirit to fill us afresh, to overflowing this morning. So, Father, all we know and all we see and all we hear is more and more of you. Father, just spoil us with your presence. Spoil us, Father, so that the enemy doesn't have any opportunity to distract us, protect us, and guide us, Lord, as we put our faith in you afresh this morning, Lord. We ask this in and through the precious name of King Jesus. Amen. Amen.